Well, good evening and welcome to the Wednesday night live stream service of Ambassador Baptist Church. We're glad that you're with us this evening. We'd like to give folks a few minutes to get connected as they get the notices. While we're waiting, if you'll turn tonight to Revelation chapter number 11, we will be looking at our continued study in the book of Revelation. We're going to be talking tonight about the Tribulation Temple. For those that may not know it, we've gone back to live streaming for the month of July because of the uh, huge increase of coronavirus cases that have been hitting the Texas area. And so some other churches have gone back to live stream. Others have made different plans. And so right now, at this particular time, we will be doing Wednesdays and Sundays uh, live streaming. Tonight we are in Revelation chapter number 11. We're going to be looking at the Tribulation Temple. Uh, verse number 1 says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall tread underfoot forty and two months. Now we are still in the midst of this parathetical passage uh, that began back in chapter 10 over the last couple of weeks. We are in the midst of a pause in the actions and activities of the tribulation period judgments between the sixth and the seventh trumpets. As we come to Revelation chapter 11, we have arrived at what some say is one of the most difficult passages in the book of Revelation. Uh, it is hard to understand, uh, some say, but keeping two thoughts in mind will help us as we study these verses. First of all, we are on Jewish ground. Uh, the images and the terminologies are all Jewish in nature. And so these verses deal with the future of the people of Israel uh, because we will be in heaven at this time, having been raptured out in chapter number four. Also, we are dealing with future events. Now, there are some that would say today that these verses uh, are for the past. Uh, some even try to make them for the present. But it seems to me that these can only fit into the future. And so we're going to study today a prophecy that is concerning the future temple that will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Uh, so I thought it would be good if we just take our time uh, for these two verses and consider some of the details that uh, these verses are discussing. With that in mind, let's see what John has to say about this future temple. Uh, there are some specific visions uh, in the book of Revelation for the Jewish people uh, about this tribulation temple that we are looking at. So, point number one is a vision of promise. Uh, as we read here in verse number one, it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and them that worship therein. And so when John mentions the temple, he is referring to a place that was dedicated to Jewish worship. Now the Jews have been without a temple for nearly 2,000 years. And so this verse makes it crystal clear that there is a new temple that will be built there in Jerusalem. Uh, and it will be built during the tribulation period. And so a brief study of the history, the past history of the temple for some 500 years. Uh, from the time of Moses to David, the people of Israel worshiped God at a tabernacle. It was there that sacrifices were carried out. It was there that the priests made intercession for the sins of the people. It was there that Israel sought their God. And you know, those of us that uh, go from Ambassador Baptist Church, that we studied the temple in detail. Uh, before David died, uh, he expressed the desire to build a permanent house of God, a temple, uh, where God's presence could dwell. Uh, you can read about that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. God, however, refused to allow David to build the temple because he was a man of war. Uh, so the privilege of building this temple then fell to David's son Solomon. Now David was not allowed to build the temple, but he was allowed to accumulate the building materials uh, that would be necessary for its construction as well as the finances needed. Uh, but before David died, he charged Solomon that he was to build the temple. So Tal uh, Solomon built that temple as he was commanded by David. 
It took him seven years to complete the building. When it was finished, it was dedicated to the Lord with a lavish sacrifice. In 1 Kings chapter 8, and verse 63, it says that there were uh, 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep that were offered to the Lord at that temple dedication. And at this dedication, when the Ark of the Covenant was brought from the tabernacle into the temple, God demonstrated his approval of this house of worship by filling it with his Shekinah glory. And that's in 2 Chronicles chapter number 7. And so this magnificent temple uh, cost an enormous amount of money to build. Uh, now the Illinois Society of Architects estimated back in 1925 that it would have cost $87 billion uh, to build that temple. Now if the temple were to be built today, it is uh, estimated that that cost would approach somewhere around $500 billion. Uh, so this temple building... Uh, dominated the Jerusalem skyline until it was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar in 538 BC. The Jews were taken into captivity at this time. Some were allowed to return Jerusalem, and in 490 BC the temple was rebuilt by Zerubbabel. However, this temple was not as elaborate or as beautiful as the first temple uh, that had been built. Now the prophet Haggai writes in Haggai 2.3, who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? And so the, the new temple was like nothing compared uh, to that temple that Solomon had built. Ezra 3.12 adds insight regarding the rebuilt temple. He said, But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men, that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. Now this temple was also destroyed. In 168 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple by slaughtering a, cat, a, a pig on the altar and demanding that he be worshipped as God. Then he dismantled the temple. In an effort to gain support of the Jews, Herod the Great rebuilt this temple in around 6 BC. Now Herod's temple took 46 years to build, uh, John chapter 2 and verse 20, and it was far grander than the second temple uh, was. It would have been Herod's temple uh, where the Lord Jesus worshipped and preached. Uh, this temple was also slated for destruction. In Matthew 24 verses 1 and 2, Jesus prophesied that the temple would be destroyed. And so this took place in 70 AD when Titus of, of the, uh, the Roman general besieged Jerusalem. During that siege, which lasted from 66 AD to 70 AD, some one million Jews were slain. It is said that Titus crucified so many Jews uh, during this siege that he ran out of wood to make new crosses and that the roads were literally lined with crosses occupied by the rotting remains of their Roman victims. Uh, when Jerusalem fell in 70 AD, the city was destroyed and the temple was utterly demolished. All that remains of the ancient temple is the Western Wailing Wall. Now, Orthodox Jews go there to pray every day. Uh, they believe that all their prayers ascend to heaven by means of Jerusalem. So they write their prayers on paper and stuff them in the cracks of the wall. Uh, Jews from around the world are able to email their prayers to Jerusalem. Then these prayers are printed and they are taken uh, to the Wailing Wall. So currently the Jews have no temple, but that will all change in the near future. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and the church is raptured out, uh, then we go into the tribulation and that temple will be uh, rebuilt. And so then there is the present preparation uh, for the temple. When John mentions a temple in verse 1, he is letting us know the truth that a new temple must be built in Jerusalem. Now it may surprise some to learn that some people are already making uh, preparations for such an event today. Uh, let's take a quick look at what the Jews are doing to get ready. 
the one problem that has always stood between the Jews and a new temple is the Mosque of Omar, or you may know it as the Dome of the Rock. This is the third holiest site for Muslims. It was completed in 691 AD, and inside the dome is a great rock. Now, Muslims believe that the uh, Muhammad ascended into heaven from this rock, conferred with Moses, and returned to the earth with the prayers that all Muslims are supposed to pray. Uh, for many centuries, it was believed that the Dome of the Rock was built on the original site of the temple. It was believed that the Dome of the Rock would have to be demolished before the new temple could be rebuilt. However, recent excavations reveal that the ancient temple was actually about 100 yards north of the Dome of the Rock site. And so this new temple could be built without disturbing the Muslim holy place. Uh, by the way, uh, the problem in the Middle East today, they are not political problems. They are religious problems. Every group involved in this turmoil in Israel wants control of the ancient city of Jerusalem. It is the most contested ground in the world today. Uh, for the Jews, their struggle is one of survival. Because uh, for the Arabs and Muslims, their goal is to annihilate all of Israel. Uh, but that will all be settled one day. Uh, but it's interesting to read uh, the preparations that the Orthodox Jews are making for the rebuilding of their temple. One group, known as the Temple Institute, is dedicated to the idea of rebuilding the Jewish temple. They have been working to prepare for the day when the temple is built in reality. Uh, they've already prepared many of the items that they will need uh, to resume temple worship. And so uh, they have already built the golden altar of incense, uh, the menorah, uh, the table of showbread. They have reconstructed most of the garments worn by the high priest. Uh, they have also produced many of the instruments used by the Levites in temple worship. And so the day is coming and the Jews are getting ready. They know that a new temple will indeed stand in Jerusalem someday soon. All the Jews need are the ashes of the red heifer so that they can consecrate a priest. And they are doing their best to breed uh, acceptable animals as we speak and working on trying to get that uh, last thing that they need uh, to put in place. They're also trying to find the Ark of the Covenant uh, and they may succeed with all of this one day. Uh, if they continue their work. At any rate, uh, much more could be said about this Jewish preparation and about the rebuilding of the temple. This is just a small amount of exciting news. And when I think about this, it makes me want to look up uh, because our redemption draweth nigh. Because before all of this can take place, uh, the, the temple t being rebuilt and everything, the church must be raptured out. But there is also a third thing, and that is the powerful message of the temple. The message delivered by this promise of a new temple in Jerusalem is that God is not finished with the Jewish people. Uh, they are his chosen people. Uh, he still has a plan for them. Right now we are living in the church age, uh, a time from where Christ came and, and the Jews rejected him until the church is raptured out in the church age uh, where the Gentiles can trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, but it's already been uh, that the Jews returned to their homeland on May 14th in 1948 and a nation that had been extinct for nearly 1900 years uh, was raised literally from the ashes. And so Israel became a nation and was restored to her former land. Uh, the Jews began to return to, to uh, Israel, and uh, our generation has seen God's hand of protection upon the Jewish people during the wars that they have fought and the ones that they have won with overwhelming odds that are against them. And so God isn't through yet with the Jews. He will continue to use them, and he will save a remnant of the Jewish people in the end. And so this promise of a new temple is simply God's way of saying, I am not finished with Israel. Notice number two, there is a vision of preservation. Uh, John is told to take a read and to measure the temple, the altar, and the worshipers. Now this read refers, uh, refers to a, a plant that is grown in the Jordan Valley. Reeds grow to a height of anywhere from 15 to 20 feet. Uh, they are hollow and they are lightweight. 
yet they are exceedingly strong. In Ezekiel 29, they were used for a walking stick. Uh, in 3 John, uh, in, in verse 13, they're cut down and uh, sharpened and used as riding tools. Uh, they were also used in ancient times as measuring sticks. And so a rod is about six cubits or nine feet long. And John is told to measure uh, the temple with that rod. Uh, this is symbolic of a couple of things. First of all, a symbol of full preservation. Uh, the act of measuring speaks of possession. And so God is claiming the temple, the altar, and the worshipers as his own. Again, just another reminder that God is not through with the Jewish people. For instance, you can read it in Revelations chapter 11. Secondly, it is a symbol of faithful preservation. God is going to keep every promise that he has ever made uh, to the nation of Israel. Uh, he has set them aside for a time uh, because of their unbelief, because of their rejection. But in the end, uh, Israel will be saved. God will continue to work in and through Israel until a remnant is saved. Now, there are some in our day attempting to replace Israel with the church. Uh, they claim that Israel has been forever set aside and the church has inherited the promises of God that were made to Israel. We do not want the promises of God that were made to Israel. Uh, the promises that we have as a church are far superior to those that were given to Abraham and to his descendants. They will inherit the earth. Uh, we will inherit a home in glory. And so there is a difference between Israel and the church. And that difference must always be kept in mind when we're studying the Bible. So we have a vision of promise, a vision of preservation, but thirdly, there is a vision of punishment. Now, while this measuring of the temple is in one sense a blessing for the nation of Israel, it is also brings to mind the image of judgment. Uh, the rod is mentioned four times in the book of Revelation. One is in these verses. The three other times are in connection with the Lord Jesus as they tell us that he will rule this world with a rod of iron. So while there is in a vision of promise and preservation, there is also a vision of of punishment. Now let's look first of all at the realities of this punishment. John is told not to measure the outer court of the temple. It is to be given to the Gentiles and they will occupy the city for three and one half years. Uh, these are the days of the second half of the tribulation period. Uh, these uh, verses bring out some thoughts that need to be considered. Uh, for instance, the temple will be rebuilt sometime during the early days of the tribulation. No doubt one of the first accomplishments of the Antichrist will be to arrange a peace treaty between Israel and her enemies. He will do uh, what no other diplomat has ever been able to do. Even today, uh, diplomats and world leaders are trying to secure peace in Jerusalem. Uh, even today with a peace agreement that they're trying to put into place. But all of this is going to fail. Uh, the Antichrist will bring a temporary peace. When the Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, comes, he will bring permanent peace to Israel. And so this peace treaty will give the Jews the right to build their house of worship, uh, found in Daniel chapter 9, and verse 27. So the Jews will rebuild their temple, they will begin their sacrificial system of worship, and once again the Jews will slaughter animals in an attempt to keep the law of God. Now this will go well for a while. But somewhere around the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist will enter into the Holy of Holies in this temple and he will put himself on the throne as God. Uh, remember that Antichrist is a great imitator. And see, he will imitate that he is God. Now this event will mark the beginning of the most intense times of persecution that Israel will ever experience. Uh, the Jews will lose their temple. They will be driven from their lands. They will be hunted down and killed by the forces of the Antichrist and the rest of their enemies. Now, secondly, notice the reason for this punishment. Israel will be shown in the most vivid manner possible that animal sacrifices cannot take away sin and it cannot bring peace with God. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. 
and that no man can come to the Father but by him. So God will allow them to rebuild their temple, and he will allow them to sacrifice again. However, their new temple is nothing more than a further rejection of their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sacrifice repudiate the gospel and reject the cross and the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ did what the blood of animals could never do and will ever be able to do. And so their refusal to accept the preaching of the cross by the 144,000 Jewish preachers that we've already looked at, that will not go unpunished. Today, if you reject Jesus Christ and you die without him, you will spend an eternity in the lake of fire. Uh, back in this day, during this time, uh, because they rejected the gospel, the Jews will pay a price. They will be persecuted. Uh, they will be pursued by their enemies. This process will, uh, uh, process will serve to purify the Jewish nation and to prepare them for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes, the remnant of the Jewish nation that is left will turn to him and they will receive him as their Messiah. Uh, Zechariah chapter number 12. Now, uh, some preachers are preaching that the Jews are saved by a different method than other people. But in truth, there is one plan of salvation for all people, and his name is Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is uh, none other name under heaven given among men whereby one must be saved. And so the Jews have rejected Jesus. Uh, they will be punished as a result, and then those who believe will be saved. And so I hope that you can see from these verses that God still has a plan for Israel and for the future of Israel. I also hope that you can see from the current events that everything today is lining up to ensure that God's plan will be brought to pass. Uh, Israel is already preparing to build their temple. They are looking for their Messiah to come and save them. Well, he is coming. Uh, but I would like to be able to tell them that he has already come and been here. Uh, he has shed his blood. He has paid for the sin. And he will save all those who will call on him today uh, in, by faith. And so I hope that you are ready to meet Jesus. He is coming. And his coming, I believe, is very soon. If you're watching this and you're not saved, you can be saved today by coming to Jesus by faith by repenting of your sins, asking him to forgive you of your sins, and to come into your life and save you. If you will do that, he will save you, he will forgive you, he will put your name in the Lamb's book of life, and when the trump of God sounds, you will be raptured out uh, with the rest of us, and you will not have to go through uh, this terrible tribulation uh, that we have been studying. If you are saved, then you ought to thank him that you're saved today uh, and thank him for what he has done. Uh, if you are not, I mean, if you are saved but you're not walking with the Lord like you should, then you need to come and repent of that sin and call upon the Lord to forgive you and to be cleansed of that sin and to, to begin to walk close to the Lord again today. I do not want to be doing something uh, that I ought not to be doing when the Lord comes. That's why the Lord told us uh, that we needed to be ready. That's why he told us to look up uh, that our redemption draweth nigh. Because the Lord Jesus Christ could come at any moment, at any time today. Uh, and you need to be ready. If you're not saved, you need to get saved before it's eternally too late. If you are saved, you need to be living for Christ as if he could come at, on, at any moment. Because he can. Uh, he will come. Uh, it could be uh, before we close our eyes tonight. So I encourage you uh, in these last days to look up that your redemption draweth nigh. But in the meantime, we need to live for the Lord. We need to get the gospel out there to a lost and dying world so that they can get saved and not have to go through this terrible tribulation time. But God is not done with the Jews. Uh, but right now we're in the church age. It's an age uh, where you can come and accept Christ as your Savior. And then God will once again deal with Israel during the tribulation. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful and thankful for your word tonight. We're thankful uh, that there is a time period now called the church age where because of the rejection of Jesus Christ, the door was open for Gentiles to come and trust the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. I pray, dear Father, that you would help us to live our lives as we are in the last days and to be prepared for your coming. I pray for those that might be watching this that are not saved, that they might come to trust you 
as their Savior before it's eternally too late. And then, Father, help us uh, to be ready uh, to look up because we know that at any moment the trump of God could sound and we will be taken out of this world. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory for it because we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I hope you will come back Sunday morning at 1045 and join us again as we will be preaching the Word of God from Ambassador Baptist Church live stream services. May God bless you and you have a wonderful night.